evening, uh, our title is The Sixth Sense, Portal to the Stranger. And we're going to be offering some interpretations and then discussing uh, the tapestry of Cluny uh, called The Sixth Senses, The Lady in the Uniform. Um, I'd like to now briefly introduce Mary Jo Hughes, who's going to chair this session for us. Um, Mary Jo is a colleague and a dear friend. Um, she is a professor in the Honours Programme and chair currently of the Meaning and Transcendence Group, where we meet and discuss various novelists of the 19th and 20th century. In fact, Anne Davenport is also a member of that group. And uh, Mary Jo has reflected long and hard on questions of both modern and postmodern literature. And uh, she's also, no doubt, an expert in the Middle Ages. We will discover tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce my colleague uh, Anne Davenport, also a, a professor in the honors program. Uh, Anne tells me that she's been fascinated by the unicorn tapestries for a long time since her godfather, Bertrand Gastorg, wrote a novel about them, La Dame et la Unicorn, uh, published in 1958. Um, Anne wrote her doctoral dissertation on medieval theories of the infinite, which was published as a book in 1999, and uh, recently has turned to, this, um, to the 17th century with a book on Descartes published in 2006. Uh, however, she focuses for the most part on the scholastic roots of the early modern age. Three articles that she's written appearing in 2009 study Angels in Early Modern Philosophy, attempts to revive medieval disputation in the 17th century, in a 17th century English author, and the theology of the 14th century scholastic Peter Aureoli. Um, finally, Anne has done some translation um, talks for Jean-Luc Marion and um, a book by Jean-Louis Christian on the phenomenology of religion, the call and the response published by Fordham Press in 2004. So I'm delighted to introduce my friend and colleague. Thank you, thank you, Josie. Um, well, welcome all. I, I'm really going to, I checked with Richard and I thought really what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend we're at the Cluny Museum mm -hmm. and look at these wonderful tapestries that are so extremely enigmatic uh, and that certainly have haunted me for a very long time, especially all of last year because Cluny Museum experimentally was free. So I literally went every day because <laughs> I didn't have to pay. So, and I'll give you the big secret there. If you go right at 9.15, everyone thinks it opens at 10. So if you go right at 9.15, there's nobody there. And you can <laughs> sit alone with these wonderful uh, tapestries. Now, when Richard asked me to do this, I thought I would do it in two ways. So the paper that was uh, um, on the website was really my just very pedestrian attempt as a historian, because I'm really primarily a historian by training, to simply go look at the question as whether or not there is a sixth sense and just immerse myself in the different interpretations and see which ones, in my view, had a slightly uh, better fit with the tapestries themselves. But of course, it's a completely open book what these tapestries are. So part of my handout is simply to follow the argument I'm making but you can certainly write in all of your thoughts and then we can have a big discussion. Uh, I suspect Richard's interpretation is gonna be very different than mine. So this is sort of the, um, the, the, the fun of it. Um, one, one of the things we do know is that they were commissioned by a member of the Leviste family, a family which in the 15th century became quite powerful in the sort of um, magistry and world of law, but they were not the old feudal nobility. They were very much an up and coming bourgeois family from Lyon. After looking at the many different uh, interpretations, it really did seem to me that given the very close relationship of Jean Gerson to Lyon, that the case might be made, could be made fruitfully 
that what these tapestries represent are some sort of very specific transformation. Jean Gerson has the wonderful word nuance from a courtly ethos to a more spiritual ethos. And in that connection, if nothing else, I, I'm delighted to sort of bring Jean Gerson to the table of hospitality and the stranger because he's a very interesting figure in the history of uh, theology and mysticism. In many ways, I feel he allows us to continue from last session to bring together Levinas's idea that the ethical self is somehow the most fundamental, fundamental self, that ethics is prior to ontology, prior, uh, that ethics is first philosophy, which is really Levinas's great uh, contribution and criticism of Heidegger, right? I mean, I think there's no question. And I'm hoping to convince you today that Jean Gerson has exactly this, uh, this idea. Jean Gerson being really the spokesman of a very classical, lengthy, cumulative theory of mystical theology. He's not a particularly original, but, but what is original about Jean Gerson is the desire to go bring it to a larger public. Unlike Levinas, and this was a question that uh, Gloriana, that you were asking, he, Gerson, of course, has the idea of a developmental uh, approach, and in particular, the idea of adult development. Exactly your question. How can we go from this adult constituted self to a more flexible self, a more hospitable self? And one of the interesting things, obviously, is that uh, Jean Gerson has this idea. Jean Gerson himself came from a very poor family. Uh, in his case, uh, the church worked very much uh, as a meritocracy. He was able to, he was very talented. Uh, he was recognized by his teachers uh, and, and really excelled at work, became chancellor of the University of Paris, a position of extreme uh, importance and influence. He was uh, preached to the court. Uh, he was very close to the seat of power. In addition, though, he was absolutely determined to widen uh, mystical theology, bring it to lay people. So he wrote in the vernacular, he preached in the vernacular. He says, especially to my sisters, he insists at every turn of the, uh, at every uh, chance he gets to say that you don't need to be a monk, you do not need to be a cleric. Christian perfection is open to everyone. Uh, and this is an important thing, and he really hoped to reform the mores. Now, one of the reasons I, I, I want you to keep this in mind is something sort of more than an academic uh, issue. At the very same time, keep in mind that at the pr almost the same decade that these tapestries were woven, in a place like Coventry in the Midlands of England, lollards were being burned at the stake for having the Lord's Prayer in the vernacular. And that was the only thing that was reproached to them. So the issue of expanding, and to use uh, uh, Richard's vocabulary, the idea of meeting and welcoming the aspirations of a wider audience to become more spiritual, to develop as adults, rather than uh, react with hostility, uh, is really exemplified by Jean Gerson. Consequently, by the end of the 15th century, he was very famous. He was especially um, loved and cherished in exactly the sort of family that Le Viste was. And in Lyon, he was uh, treated locally as a saint. It was hoped that he would be canonized. And there was quite a lot of effort to try to uh, get him canonized. Um, so this is why I thought it would be very interesting to tie these tapestries at the end of the 15th century to this wonderfully betwixt and between early humanism. Gerson was very influenced by Petrarch uh, and with his, pro his project of reforming Mores. So with this, let's go to the museum itself.
Now, as you know, there are six tapestries. The standard, most sober interpretation is that they constitute the five senses and some additional sixth sense, maybe free will, we're not sure. Um, having said that, uh, there are a lot of problems with that interpretation as well, starting with the fact that in the uh, tapestry that depicts taste, she's not actually tasting anything, and why is that? Um, alternative interpretations uh, say, well, no, maybe these were tapestries commissioned for a wedding, for example. There are two very strong arguments against that. One, as you can see from my handout, we don't have anything like the mating that uh, Gourlay claims. There isn't a maiden. There are six very distinct figures. And you can see it if you look at their faces. And it's not because these weavers couldn't do the same face. The rabbits are all exactly the same rabbits from one tapestry to another. So great effort was put in to individualizing these figures and making sure that it wasn't one single lady that is represented in all six unicorns. The second big argument against something against a, a wedding present commission is simply that the only coat of arms represented are the coat of arms of the Leviste family, and that that so historians of art who know a, a lot more about it than I do assure me that it would be unprecedented and an extreme. Uh, really a, a, a gross uh, break of custom and courtesy to represent only one family if it's in a marriage um, uh, commission. So those, that attractive as that may be, there are some very strong arguments why it doesn't exactly uh, fit it. Well, as I say, <laughs> we're now going to read these tapestries as though they were, they were books. In my opinion, the lady now is the lady is reaching out to a chalice-like dish presented to her by her maid servant. Now, the person who I feel has given the strongest arguments in defense of her interpretation is a woman called Marie Elisabeth Brühl, who, in 2000, said, "You know, these figures." are very literal depictions of the courtly virtues that appear in the Roman de la Rose. She's a specialist of the Roman de la Rose. And she shows in particular a long tradition of representing the figure of generosity of spirit or nobility of spirit, franchise, in the Roman de la Rose with exactly the veil uh, that's lifted by the wind. So there's literally a long icon iconographic tradition of that particular figure from the Roman de la Rose in exactly that uh, uh, image with the veil. So that was very, and then you look, I really followed her arguments very carefully. I looked back to the Roman de la Rose, checked her arguments against the text. They're very convincing. They're extremely convincing. My question, however, is, is that all that's happening? And this is where I have the idea that for each figure from the Roman de la Rose, what these tapestries do is associate each figure to a given taste, a sense, in order to transmute Gerson's lovely word, muance, into a more spiritual figure. And that, in fact, we have a lot of evidence that Gerson very explicitly attacked the Roman de la Rose for its overly courtly ethos, especially the second part of the Roman de la Rose by Jean Demain, much too naturalistic, much too skeptical. And Jean Gerson was really at the forefront of trying to bring, move away from this courtly, worldly ethos to a more spiritual one. And as um, Monseigneur Combe, one of the great students of uh, Jean Gerson, points out, he f appropriates the methods of the Roman de la Rose, which is to use personification, but then changes it into personas, figures of these stages and phases, developmental stages of the spiritual life. In the case of uh, a taste, 
Uh, we have therefore a franchise. Uh, Marie Elisabeth Brühl points out that we are very convincingly in the pleasure garden. Uh, we know that because of the beautiful vegetation, the exotic animals, uh, some of the uh, plants are the, exactly the ones that are described in the Roman de la Rose. And so, so far, so courtly, the lapdog is a gift from the suitor to the lady signifying uh, love. The elegant parrot is a symbol of the suitor uh, himself. And franchise, the virtue, the courtly virtue of nobility of soul, uh, is the opposite of vilaini. And franchise, the, the, uh, the uh, etymology of franchise obviously is freedom. Franchise is the distinctive hallmark of free persons as opposed to vilaini baseness, which is associated with serfs, vilains, and people who act under compulsion. So franchise, generosity of spirit, uh, one of her characteristics in the Roman de la Rose is that she gives candies as opposed to uh, uh, angrily pushing the dish away. So what possible connection is there between franchise and the sensory faculty of taste? I would submit to you that by preparing herself to taste or not, Franchise discovers that nobility of character, franchise, stems precisely from the power to abstain, the power to interrupt the whole spontaneity of material appetite through the exercise of free agency. What Gerson in his vernacular treatises calls la franche volonté free will that knows itself by the self-awareness that I am free to taste or not to taste, and consequently I am free to give or not to give. Unlike every other taste, in order for me to taste something, I have to exercise some sort of action or gesture, or, or else I will only taste the inside of my mouth. So the idea that taste now, as you know, the medievals, uh, late medievals, also have the idea of the um, senses as portals of the outside world into the soul. One of the most important sources of Gerson is the Franciscan Bonaventure. And for, for Bonaventure, if we use our senses correctly, in the most ordinary exercise of sense, we take in the measure, proportion, and beauty of the world, and we understand what he calls the vestiges of God in creation. In this one in particular, the idea of free agency, which would explain why the maidservant in this tapestry inflects her knee in recognition of the soul's spiritual dignity. Suddenly the human face the veil with the wind of freedom is at the center of creation. Notice that the animals, the dog, the lion, are the, the, the monkey are sort of, they cannot resist their appetites. They are eagerly hoping for treats. So the human free agency, franchise, becomes a principle of distribution, of order, of measure, Roses bloom on the trellis behind Franchise, ma marking the place where she stands as a place franche, a place of rational autonomy within the cosmic island, an enclosed garden where the soul discovers itself as my sister, my spouse, from the uh, Song of Songs. So the idea that the courtly virtue of Franchise if properly understood, if reflected upon, implies the higher spiritual virtue of franche volonté, free agency, is what I interpret this tapestry to be doing and thus to be inviting us to reflect on how fran franchise is transformed into moral freedom. <coughs> 
which will have to learn to discern what to welcome, what to reject, what to give, what to withhold. And this corresponds in uh, Gerson, so I, ha I have it written on my, um, on my handout, to the first level of uh, contemplative theology, which is cogitatio. And those of you who have studied Descartes will immediately recognize it as the place where self-awareness and free agency presents you with a choice. Now that I know this freedom, I can continue and develop and grow, unlike bestial creation around me which cannot. It therefore becomes a responsibility. I can welcome that free agency or I can reject it. But if I welcome it, it poses questions. I must have ways to discern how to exercise it. Which brings us to hearing. Um, Marie-Elisabeth Brühle has very convincingly, in my opinion, argued that here we have a figure of the courtly virtue of liesse, joy. Indeed, in the Roman de la Rose, she's associated with singing. But unlike the figure in the Roman de la Rose, she's not dancing. She's very immobilized and extremely attentive to her musical instrument, which of course requires an enormous amount of work. Now, according to Jean Gerson, music is the perfect metaphor for the second stage of the spiritual life, which is meditatio. In connection with meditatio, Gerson speaks in the vernacular of sobre liesse, sober joy, where skilled music is contrasted to the cacophony disorder of worldly and profane sound. And unlike profane sound that simply is noise and makes our hearing uh, less perfect, skilled music that seeks to understand the principles of composition and ultimately seeks to create harmony and is able to welcome or receive the music of the spheres becomes a key way to train the ear to go understand the spiritual symbolic levels of messages. Which is again, it's interesting from the developmental point of view when we think of the, uh, the metalinguistic Right? So he really, now I can't stress to you how profound this is in Gerson. He has an enormous book, La Doctrine du Chant du Coeur, and a long, complicated treatise of music, both one in Latin, one in the vernacular, to convince everyone that if we just study music, and of course to them music is part of mathematics, uh, it's part of astronomy, they're absolutely convinced that there's music of the spheres, and if we were just pure enough, we'd be able to hear them. So. Uh, this is here. Now, Rilke has a marvelous reaction here that maybe, Richard, you're going to be citing, that the, uh, the unicorn seems bathed in calming waves. In his mystical theology, uh, Jean Gerson says, the, it, so the soul, the meditative soul, meditatio, is like Orpheus that wants to redeem Eurydice from the brute uh, cacophony of the sensual world, help her organize it so she can come up to music, where Eurydice is a figure of the intellect uh, being redeemed from the world of senses by music and by Orpheus. And he goes on and on and on with this idea. Meditatio, according to Gerson, is associated with effort. It, is, it corresponds to discursive, uh, theology, reasoning, uh, it, it, it's, it's lengthy, it requires perseverance as an entire training of welcoming order into the human body, really, and into the senses. And once we have meditated deeply enough, long enough, we then come to sight. Sight, according to uh, Gerson, culminates speculative theology, the theology that is guided by the intellect and seeks truth. Now, uh, Brühl has shown in great detail 
how this figure is the figure of idleness, oiseuse from the Roman de la Rose. And as she says nicely, oiseuse is a very enigmatic figure. Uh, she carries a mirror, that's one of her signs. She's the one who brings the poet into the garden, welcomes the poet into the garden. But at the same time, there's something dangerous and complex about her. Uh, idle, idleness is necessary, uh, but it can be misused. It's problematic. According to, now if we read it, we see something interesting. Obviously, this is the one where the unicorn is no longer holding a banner, but is sort of affectionately uh, sitting on the, the lady's lap. The lion is looking elsewhere entirely. There's a great sense of peace and repose. Jean Gerson describes at great length the state of contemplatio as being on a high mountain. This is the state where pure intelligence immediately grasps the principles of science. So there's a sort of immediacy, and at the same time, Gerson says, a reflexivity. The pure, the purified, purged intellect recognizes itself and beholds itself. The pure eye beholds itself. At the same time, and I think this is what really problematizes the interpretation if we think of this as the lover being captured, etc. I think you will notice, and you'll see it in the, in the drawing, in my handout, the woman's face is very sad, really forlorn. And that's a very mysterious thing, because you would think you know, the unicorn's there, she's welcoming the unicorn. What is the source of this sadness? According to Gerson, the most important part, the most important feature of contemplative, of contemplation, contemplatio, is the sadness that it provokes in the soul. The pure intellect sees itself in her mirror, but she herself cannot see it as though robbed of her own insight. What is lured optically into the intellect's hospitality is only an intentional object, the idea of God, the image of God, not God. Contemplatio recognizes the ultimate vanity of her speculative effort, the futility of a purely intellectual cognition. Her achievement is real. She sees not with the fleshly eye, but with the mind's timeless eye. But her grasp of first truths leaves her <laughs> sterile, separate, alone with simul simulacra. According to Gerson, the chief benefit of contemplative theology is to disclose that the mind's capture of pure truth leaves the soul infinitely distant from God. The sterility of intellectual contemplation of science reveals God's absence. Voluptas, happiness, is not in contemplatio's garden. Contemplating truth in the mirror of pure intelligence leaves the soul disconsolate. From now on, the soul will set knowledge aside and turn to what Gerson calls the irrational wisdom and folly of the heart. So after these three first stages of speculative theology, he then moves to mystical the theology, which is the one that is opened to everyone. So then we move to, to smell. Now this one is ex wonderful because the, those who interpret the tapestries to be a wedding present are fond, always point to say, this is clearly a young bride. Now, the figure of beauty in the Roman de la Rose is very specifically described as having exactly the appearance of a young bride and fits this description absolutely exactly. So if we have the feeling of a young bride, it is because this figure of Bouté, who is love's special friend, and in Le Roman de, de la Rose, Bouté spends her time weaving beautiful garments of flowers and roses for love, right? So she's a marvelous figure. But I, what I find absolutely fascinating 
is that by associating beauty with smell, something wonderfully subtle and wonderfully spiritual was happening. Why? Perfume for late medievals is very closely tied to the idea of the spiritual, the spirit being able to emanate when kindled by heat or fire. So the perfume of a rose is literally the soul of the rose emanating towards us in an effort to call us in and communicate with us. And this is their view of what happens to the soul under the effect of love. They say, for example, under the effect of love, you can, be, you can exist over where the, love, the beloved is, not where you are. Love is what allows the soul to leave the body and expand towards the beloved. They even have, in scholastic theology, um, in particular the ones that are the immediate roots of Gerson, they have the idea of esse egressus, that literally my being, my soul, takes an intentional form and leaves my body and goes and lives near the beloved. So, as Gerson explains, as long as the soul remains contained in itself, confined by the intellect to its own cognitions, the soul remains cold, isolated, sterile. When celestial rays act on it, love is kindled, and the soul starts to jubilate and exult. Alchemically speaking, love volatizes the soul. Gerson tells us through love, the soul leaves itself, expands outwards as though dancing and fluttering. And this is the stage that he calls amorous desire. At this point, the soul seeks God, desires God, and is kindled by God's love to go seek God. And it seems to me that the, the, the whole imagery of perfume and of course the idea that what she is uh, weaving is really a crown of eternity, suggesting Gerson suggesting you must leave the ephemeral courtly love, transform it into the love of love eternal. And indeed, in one of his vernacular treatises, Gerson has a whole chapter that says how courtly beauty can be used as a symbol of spiritual beauty. And where the soul now, in its des amorous desire for God, will seek to become beautiful through practices, through changing gestures, through incense, through welcoming the whole idea of beauty into daily life as a, as a means to progress. Which brings us uh, again to the next stage that corresponds to meditatio, which is the hard, difficult one, which culminates in touch The lady crowned with a royal diadem and dressed in a dark robe represents richesse, the courtly virtue of richesse. And notice if you see her face, it's very, very clear in the Roman de la Rose that this must be an elder, older person. So again, this really flies in the face of the wedding commission interpretation. She's older, she's stately, uh, she's very regal. She has very specific jewelry, a very specific crown, a very specific belt. And in particular, in the Roman de la Rose, uh, Richesse wears magic um, uh, stones, precious stones, that are associated with protecting you from poison and healing you. Now, as you know, the horn of the unicorn uh, protects us against poison. If you, the, the unicorn dips its horn in a river, uh, the poison disappears. So through the, so now what, what is Gerson doing here? Possibly the second stage mortification of mystical theology which really transforms the human being from the old man into the new man. Notice that all the animals are shackled in the background. They're either imprisoned or have collars, etc. So the brutal, brutish, best bestial part of touch and senses uh, is completely 
um, uh, sequestered. And the reward is mystical touch. In the recovery of the mystical senses follows the opposite order. The highest mystical t sense is actually touch. The lowest of our fallen senses is touched, but it's reversed sort of symmetrically. So touch, and for example, in St. John of the Cross, the touch of God is the, is the moment of, of, real, of real union. Um, so if we think of this as in courtly terms, richesse signifies that courtly love is the heart's cure, the heart's royal treasure, compared to which everything else is dross. Analogously, but at a higher level, spiritual richesse signifies that love of God is the heart's royal treasure, compared to which everything else is dross. Spiritual richesse coincides with the healing power of contrition beyond amorous desire and is none other than perfect mortification. Spiritual richesse stands very straight, very vigilant, fixed and transfixed. The, suddenly the unicorn and the lion are very small because both the intellect and courage are transcended. The lady looks very far at a point at infinity, at, a, at an infinite horizon. Spiritual richesse firm, notice you have a sort of a triple axis mondi connecting time and eternity bridging worlds. The lion's energetic courage has been fully appropriated. The soul is fully resolved, healed, victorious over earthly touch. Uh, the, um, she touches, she holds the unicorn's horn, symbolic of the purity that now protects the soul against the poison of profane wealth, etc. And I wanted to add, there's, there's also in Gerson a considerable amount of alchemical language and metaphors. And in particular, the long-awaited moment of fixation in alchemy, when spirit and matter are permanently united, heralds the final metamorphosis, the point of no return, and the imminent emergence of the philosopher's stone. And it's very interesting in, in alchemy because one of the ways the uh, uh, adepts can blow it is by not having the patience to go wait for the moment of fixation. And they become impatient and they say, oh, I have to start all over again. Right? So there's this, this sort of image there. Which now brings us to the sixth sense because insofar as I'm arguing over and beyond Brühl that each one of these courtly virtues has been attached to a sense in order to operate this transformation into a spiritual figure. We are allowed to speak of a sixth sense. Now the really interesting thing here, even in the Roman de la Rose, so I'm starting with uh, a Brühl's analysis. She says this is clearly the character of largesse the one who gives liberality, who is never happier than when she can take, say, take this. And the characteristic of largesse is that she's giving away her jewels and that her throat is bare. Seems to me that this is what we see. Now, Brühl, who wants it just to be the courtly figures, says, <coughs> well, you know, the pavilion, that's just a, it's without any important iconographic importance. It's just there, you know, because, you know, pavilions are pretty, so why not put a pavilion? Seems to me that that's a little bit, it's such a magnificent pavilion, it seems almost a pity to do that. So how can we do this? Now, the really interesting thing is that in the Roman de la Rose, totally worldly, totally courtly, totally profane, all of a sudden, the character of largesse, all of a sudden, God appears and, and, and is cited. And in particular, so this is in the text of Guillaume de Loris, God ca causes her wealth to multiply so that however much she gives away, she always has more. And she's also connected with the Arthurian leisure, uh, legend uh, and to chivalry and therefore to the ever replenished Holy Grail. So it's very curious because in the Roman de la Rose there's already something like a possibility of mutation in this direction. So what, uh, what sort of sense will it, uh, 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 does it correspond to? Uh, this, the highest stage, the sixth stage uh, for Jean Gerson, what he calls ecstatic love, is actually the state of prayer.
And I find that really interesting because it brings us away from something overly vague. According to Gerson, the, the state of prayer is extremely subtle. His descriptions are absolutely marvelous. They're very close to Levinas's, what, what Jeff was reading to us last week about community is prior to solitude, etc. cetera. Um, and in particular, according to Gerson, this is the stage, I sort of wanted to, to, to read from it, the stage where really the, the the self gives up even its own will to God. So what then is the sixth sense? Through most of Gerson, it is synderesis, the highest part of the soul, higher than pure intelligence. And Gerson cites Augustine, who describes saint Thérèse as the soul's weight in his very famous Augustinian statement, pondus meum amor meus. But then I would submit to you we have a problem because if Cinderesis is the soul's inclination to seek God and thus the soul's sense of its own exile, Cinderes must in some sense vanish or be transformed in the ecstatic union with God. Gerson says when the soul is purified, illuminated, and tested, nothing prevents it from being transported by love to the one who is wholly desirable and loving and, and lovable. When the soul is conjoined and united with God, Gerson says, quote, it embraces its supreme good, its center, its destination and perfection. What else could it possibly need? What else could it desire? A mon seul désir. So I think if you really spend a lot of time with Gerson's theory of prayer, he has something like the, the, the idea that when Cinderesis finds its place of rest, to use a sort of Aristotelian uh, metaphor, but that is suggested by Augustine's own, own words, and if you connect it deeply with the sense of prayer, The sixth sense is really something like the sense that with God all things are possible. So really a sense that can make no sense at all in our, what Levinas would call our egological ways of thinking, our scientific ways of thinking, our phenomenological ways of thinking. Now at the end, I just wanted to bring in the, uh, the idea of the dog, but this was sort of a little bit playful. Michel Rousset has a marvelous interpretation of these tapestries. It's, he, there's no attempt whatsoever to be historically grounded, but it's still marvelous. And he says that last one, she, he says that's the initiation into the level of language and identity, and we have to give up all the pleasures of the senses. And so he interprets that woman as having her face full of regret, which I don't think is completely right. But I said, back in the garden, the lap dog stares grimly at the viewer perched on a silk cushion that hides a plain wood bench. Its jewel collar is gone. Michel Serre has right that regret is not absent from the scene, but it is the lapdog's regret that haunts the pleasure garden, not pur amour, which is the, the sixth sense, the, the ecstatic state of ecstatic prayer, who has discarded all possibility of regret along with self-volition. What have you done, the lapdog, the lapdog asks reproachfully with courtly love? Amidst the mille fleurs, the birds of paradise, the trees, the rich brocades, the fire of the lion, the radiance of the unicorn, the laugh dog is now a figure of the soul's exile, stuck with its body, its hope of reward, its inadequate fidelity, and its five narrow senses. Profane virtues flatter us, but they pass through us like a dream, leaving no trace, until the soul is moved from inside elsewhere, to discover the country that will be shown to it. Where the soul, according to Gerson, becomes a beggar, and this is what brings the theme of hospitality, I thought, to the forefront, Richard. In his little treatise on la mendicité spirituelle, so uh, spiritual beggars, 
Gerson argues that, in, that why is the state of prayer our supreme state, our supreme ethical state? Because in that state, we are, we understand ourselves to be beggars, welcomed at every instant into God's tent, receiving everything from God, but consequently profoundly in touch with the needs of the whole rest of the universe and cosmos. Therefore, our prayers are to constantly, tirelessly beg God for graces for all of creation. So largesse, liberality, is no longer preoccupied with giving stupid things like jewels, but God's constellation welcoming in mercy to the rest of creation. So that, and especially if you, I was thinking of your, your whole idea about the, the hospitality in Judaism, that one of the reasons I must welcome the stranger into my tent is that in the land of Egypt, we were strangers and we were slaves. The same thing happens with Gerson and ecstatic prayer. Once I understand that I am a beggar and a cosmic beggar, every beggar is my <coughs> alter ego, quay beggar. I therefore have a responsibility to feed and, and help and nourish and sustain every beggar. Voila. Okay. I hope that what I have to say will supplement and, and somewhat complement what Anne has just said. Anne has brought you through the five senses. I'm going to concentrate on the sixth sense, represented here, as you know, uh, the, the last or the first panel, as we uh, mentioned in a moment. And in a way, as Anne initially <laughs> indicated, our readings are different, uh, in fact, very different. And yet I think around the theme of the heart, which you mentioned very much uh, at one point, the two may come together again. Um, I'm going to argue that the unicorn is a creature of embodied imagination and in fact represents the senses all six, and as such appears initially as a stranger who is hosted by the lady. But there's an ambiguity, to say the very least, in the portrait of the unicorn. For if it is a stranger, as I'll try to show, it can be treated either as a guest, welcomed into the bosom and onto the lap of the lady, or as a threatening beast who must be renounced and restrained and enchained. So my questions are going to be, who is or what is the unicorn, firstly? And then the second part of the paper, who is the lady? and how do they relate and interact to each other. Now, there have been multiple and diverse interpretations of this tapestry, and particularly of the two main characters. As you know, it's called the Lady and the Unicorn, um, throughout the centuries, since 1500, when it is said this was first woven um, and created by Jean Ypres, uh, known also as the master of Anne of Bretagne. Now, some of these interpretations, usually allegorical, include the courtly love tradition that Anne mentioned, that is to say, the lover and the beloved. The lady and the unicorn are lover and beloved. The platonic ascetic interpretation, where the lady represents chastity and contemplation, and the unicorn represents the beast of the senses to be renounced and resisted. 
There is also the interpretation, the heraldic matrimonial interpretation that Anna also mentioned, uh, where you have fiancé, um, the lady is the fiancé, and the unicorn is Jean Le Viste, for whom the tapestry, it is said, was commissioned. The heraldic signs and insignia are of the Le Viste family. And finally, and very importantly, the tapestry has also been read as representing, on the one hand, the Virgin Mary, the lady, and the unicorn as Christ. And occasionally as Gabriel, to the extent that the coming together of the unicorn and the lady, where he places his paws or hoofs, because it's a hybrid animal, as we'll see in a moment, on the lap of the lady. This is seen as Gabriel's um, overture to Mary, uh, from which the conception and incarnation ultimately ensues. And this is a certain spiritual Christian mystical interpretation of the tapestry. Now what I want to suggest is that as a, as a work of embodied imagination, this tapestry in one sense can include all of those very diverse interpretations, but also in a way transcend them, go further, and perhaps even combine them in a certain coincidencia oppositorum, as Nicholas Cusa put it, a mystical coming together of what are ostensibly opposites. On the one hand, a celebration of the five senses. On the other hand, a detachment from the five senses, as Anne has so deftly rehearsed in her presentation. I want to begin with a quotation from Rilke, who spent much time contemplating these tapestries. And he interprets the final sixth sense, which is sometimes also read as the first tapestry, the last of the first, which is significant. He interprets it as such. I quote, a tent has been erected, blue damask with a gold flame motif. The animals open it, as you can see, and she advances simply in her princely garment. For what are those pearls by her side? The maid servant has opened a small casket, and the lady now takes from it a chain, a marvellous heavy piece of jewellery, which has always been locked away in the box. The small dog is sitting near her, up on a place made for him, and looks at it. And have you read the inscription at the top of the tent? You can see it says, A mon seul désir, to my only love. Now what's interesting here is that Rilke interprets that final or inaugural gesture, because nobody knows whether this tapestry, the sixth sense, begins the series or ends the series, or both. We may have a cycle and a circle here, as I would suggest. But what's interesting about Rilke's interpretation is that contrary to the normal orthodox interpretation, and I think Jacques Song's reading maybe fits into that, open to discussion, where this scene is uh, interpreted as the lady replacing the jewels of the senses in the casket, because she has now transcended the senses, Rilke reads it as the lady assuming the jewels, taking the jewels to her bosom, so that instead of detachment, we have a form of embodiment. And of course, one of the titles of our seminar is Embodied Imagination. All right, so that's sort of a thesis. What, what is Rilke getting at? And do we have to choose between the readings of replacing the jewels in the casket versus removing them and assuming them for herself? Is she letting go of the senses or is she embracing the senses? All right, let me begin with the unicorn and then move on to the lady. Why should the unicorn be a stranger who might commend himself, itself, as a stranger eligible to be received as a guest by the lady? Why not rather an intruder who should be resisted in a gesture of hostility or imprisonment? We we'll come to the theme of the capture of the unicorn in a moment. Now I want to rehearse for a moment the negative interpretation 
the demonizing interpretations of the unicorn that go back actually to the beginning of the representations, both in the Greek pagan world and also in the biblical literature. Bartholomus and Anglicus, summing up some of these interpretations, says, the unicorn is the most cruel of beasts who will leave all his foreignness, strangeness, when it sleeps at last on the lap of a virgin, when it's captured, tamed, and chained. And this interpretation, of course, is very congruent with the equation of the unicorn with the senses, with the five senses. Uh, the senses did not have a very good um, press in a certain tradition of Western philosophy and culture. Philo of Alexandria said of the senses, they symbolize and represent female seduction and sin. Uh, Augustine, in one of his sermons on the five foolish virgins, compared the foolish virgins to the senses. Moving up to the Middle Ages, Sebastian Brandt represented the senses in terms of the female follies, a ship of fools, the five senses. Um, and we'll come to an illustration of that in a moment. And then we have Latini, uh, Bernardo Latini, who gives us a typical reading of the senses in terms of this platonic uh, warning that we must transcend the senses. He writes in the Livre du Tresor in the 13th century, 1266. And we are ahead of other animals, not by our strength nor common sense, but in reason. But the body has five other senses, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and touching. But all these are surmounted by the soul, which is seated in the master fortress of the head and considers through the judgment of its reasons what of, of its reason, what the body does not touch and which does not touch and reach the other senses of the body. So clearly here you have a philosophical reading of the senses as inferior, as insubordinate, unruly, inhospitable animal. Now, one of the earliest and influential and formative descriptions of the unicorn is to be found in Pliny the Elder's Natural History, written in 1 AD. Here he describes the unicorn as a quadruped with a single horn. And I will quote briefly his description. Pliny the Elder. But the most fell and furious beast of all the others is the licorn, unicorn, or monoceros, single horn. His body resembleth a horse, his head a stag, his feet an elephant, his tail a boar. He loweth after a hideous manner. One black horn he hath in the midst of his forehead, bearing out two cubits in length. By report, this wild beast cannot possibly be caught alive. In other words, if you want to capture the unicorn, you've got to kill it. So an attitude of extreme hostility. And the unicorn is described by Pliny the, the, the Elder as a hybrid of earth and sea creatures. On the one hand, as we've seen, a boar, an elephant, a stag, and a horse habit the earth. But the horn is said by Pliny and, and later by Marco Polo to actually derive from a sea creature a narva, as it was called, similar to a walrus. And indeed, I in the Middle Ages, uh, the, the husk of a walrus was actually powdered down and distributed as a certain form of medicine. We shall return to this in a moment. Now, in the Bible and the Church Fathers, the unicorn doesn't fare much better. One finds seven mentions of the unicorn in the Psalms and the book of Job, and its origins are linked to a malevolent and violent beast. St. Basil warns the believer, for example, quote, to be wary of the unicorn, that is the devil, for it easily commits evil against humans. St. Bernard enjoins the faithful to struggle against their demons, quote, the rage of the lion, the ferocity of the boar, and the pride of the unicorn. 
And in the famous account of Barlam and Josepha, we find Barlam setting forth to do combat with the unicorn and therefore overcome the unruly animal passions. A tale which gave rise to many medieval versions and interpretations, most notably um, that of Jacques Le Vorrain in Le Légion Doré, but also in the Brunetti Latini quotation that we just read. Incidentally, another influential text for medieval and, and then Renaissance readings of the unicorn is that of Marco Polo, who on his travels in a far continent uh, discovered the rhinoceros and described it as a unicorn. And in later representations of his uh, Livre de Merveille, uh, the rhinoceros uh, frequenting rivers and, and, and streams, and Anne mentioned this also, uh, is portrayed as a unicorn. I should mention also that Pliny the Elder when he describes the unicorn, says that it is most often encountered uh, on the frontiers of our Western world as we move eastwards. And so it's an outsider, it's a stranger, it's a threat from beyond. It's the other as a menacing monster. Now, as we come to the 12th century, we find somewhat more positive portraits of the, un of the unicorn. Now, most dramatically and graphically, this is represented by the young girl receiving the unicorn in her womb or breast. And we've seen that in uh, the, uh, the tapestry on the site, where the paws of the unicorn on the lap are, I think, a little bit more demonstrative than contemplative affection, but they include that too, probably. Now, this hosting of the stranger, the strange unicorn, by the host, hostess lady, was read very often in the 12th and 13th centuries as a symbol of the Annunciation and Incarnation of Christ. This theme is famously illustrated on the colonnades of St. Peter's Cathedral in Caen and in the stained glass windows of the Bourges Cathedral. In this Christian allegorical reading, the hunted and persecuted unicorn has a lance traversing its torso and becomes a symbol of the Passion of Christ. These are two such illustrations from Le Bestiaire d'Amour, where you can see the unicorn again uh, being received, being held by the lady as the hunter drives a spear through its flank. Um, this has, in both its connotations, but particularly this one, uh, certain sexual and phallic implications that we'll return to in a moment. But in addition to the sensual connotations of penetration, there is also the mystical interpretation of both the conception and incarnation, but also of the pieta, of the lance being driven through the breast of Christ. Now, it seems, they seem like strange bedfellows, but embodied imagination tends to be able to do that, work with symbols and metaphors that can go in two directions at once, a sensual, sexual one, and a mystical, and spiritual one. And maybe in this sense, as in others, the tapestry is a way of bringing together the opposite, traditionally opposite and opposed, directions of the human being into mind versus body, senses versus spirit, the material, the sensual, and the sexual versus the contemplative, the meditative, and the mental. Now, many quaint legends also rose in the Middle Ages about sightings of this strange creature at the extreme frontiers of the Western world. Uh, wherever <coughs> Westerners went, north, south, east, or west, they very often came back with sightings of the unicorn. <laughs> Travelers, adventurers, crusaders, Marco Polo amongst them. And there were even practices of circulating unicorn's horns, taken usually from the tusk of the walrus, 
whose ground powder was then considered to have magical and <coughs> mystical healing powers. And as Anne mentioned, when the unicorn um, in legend frequented rivers and dipped its horn into the rivers and waters, it was seen as an act of cleansing, of undoing the poison. And very often medicine, as you know, the snake and the unicorn have this in common, that they are creatures who are very often demonized and despised and marginalized and scapegoated, but they have the source of healing and wisdom. You find that, obviously, in, in the biblical you know, mosaic story of raising the, the, the scepter of the, of the serpent to cure the, the Israelites from the, the poisonous bite of the serpents. And you find the same thing in the Asclepian um, Greek symbol of, you have it to this day, you know, the chemist, the pharmacy, as the, the scepter with the, with the snake wrapped around. Now this ambiguity continues in many of the Christian medieval allegories. In a 13th century text, we read that the hunted unicorn can only be caught if lured to the breast of a young virgin. But once again, in keeping with Pliny's account, the wild beast cannot be taken alive. It must be sacrificed or killed. So the capture of the unicorn, maybe we could come to that. This is from the Cloisters in New York. The capture and hunt of the universe of the unicorn can either be read as the suppression of a monstrous and containment of a monstrous devil and beast, or as a torture and infliction of pain on an innocent saviour, namely Christ. The latter reading is found in Hugh of St. Victor, and again in Albert the Great, who see the capture and immolation of the unicorns as representing, unicorn, as representing the mystery of the incarnation and crucifixion. I quote, thus did our Lord Jesus Christ, the spiritual unicorn, who descended into the womb of the Virgin to take on flesh, find himself captured and put to death. So, a profoundly ambivalent, ambiguous, rich, multivalent reading of the universe. I want to lastly mention, before I move on to the lady, um, the tradition of courtly love that Anne also mentioned, that was developed from the troubadour tradition, mainly in the 13th to the 15th century uh, centuries, and that uh, I will invoke uh, briefly in terms of two authors, Richard uh, de Fournival in his Bestie of L'Amour, the very influential Bestie of Love, and then Thibaut de Champagne, uh, who wrote a famous song and a very popular song called The Capture of the Unicorn. In both of these, we find a very interesting phenomenon, which is a circle between lover, beloved, and love. And this is called la chaîne d'amour, where the unicorn is at once a host and a hostage. The unicorn is a host to the extent that he inveigles and enchants the poet, inspires the poet to write the song, and to witness the scene of the unicorn being captured by the virgin, taken hostage. And the legend was, in, in many of these representations, that the unicorn could only be captured by the hunters, not through armaments or weapons, but by placing a virgin in a forest where its fragrance would attract the unicorn, and then it could be captured. But she was the only person who could capture the unicorn. And in some of the representations, they're pretty graphic. You have a, a naked young girl tied to a tree, and the unicorn comes, attracted by the fragrance, so smell, third sense is it? Um, and then it, it, it approaches her and actually kisses her breasts. It's very, as I said, demonstrative and dramatic. So in these uh, tales and representations of courtly love, we have the unicorn as at the, on the one hand an active seducer, and on the other hand, or a lover, and on the other hand as somebody who is passively 
captivated and captured by the lady, seduced, if you will, by the virgin. But that, there's that double move. Okay, let me briefly quote from Florival and Thibault de Champagne. Thibaut de Champagne, the capture of the unicorn, 13th century. Like the unicorn, he says, in this famous troubadour, Corti Love Song, I am lost in wonder, contemplating the young girl. He delights so in his torment, the unicorn, that he faints upon the virgin's breast, and at that moment is treacherously killed. I too have been killed in such a way. So the poet's identifying with the unicorn here. For love and for my lady, in truth, they hold my heart and I cannot recover it. Jean de Florival, as grist to the mill, when he writes in his Bestiary of Love, 13th century, mid 13th century, I quote This is why I say that if I was captivated by hearing and sight, it is no surprise if I lost my sense and memory. For hearing and seeing are the two windows to the memory, as I said above, and they are the most noble senses of man. For man has five senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and... What am I missing? Smell. 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 And I was taken by smell also, like the unicorn, who falls asleep in the sweet scent of the virginity of the demoiselle. Love, who is a cunning hunter, placed in my path a young girl, whose sweetness sent me to sleep and made me die that death that belongs to love. So the resting in the lap is here seen as a form of capture and death. And very often these representations of the capture of the unicorn were paralleled with representations of Tristan and Isolde, of Dido and Aeneas, of uh, Samson and Delilah, that is to say the famous lovers. Okay. Now, from the 14th century onwards, hundreds of different versions of the Lady and the Unicorn appear, and most of these concern her heraldic hunting scenes of the kind I've just described. <coughs> uh, frequently, the, the, the unicorn is seen as an innocent, benevolent creature. I mean, contrast this to the early notion of the monster uh, from afar who intrudes upon our civilization. Now, as an innocent, benevolent creature, who is the harbinger and carrier of healing powers. Hence its, its association with uh, the healing waters of streams where very often it is portrayed. Um, there are also legends, but I don't have time to go into it, of various travelers who claim to have seen the unicorn by rivers and streams. Uh, one in particular, I just cite one in passing, was the traveler uh, in 1480, uh, Bernard von Bredenbach, who made a holy pilgrimage to Jerusalem and claimed that he had actually seen a unicorn. So the imaginary becomes real in a way. It, it, it has become so powerful a figure of embodied imagination and of the five senses, and I would also argue the sixth, we come to that in a moment, that uh, it uh, entered into common law and this strange hybrid zone of reality and imagination uh, becomes part of the literature. And even Rabelais, for example, parodies this uh, scene of uh, the travelers claiming to see the unicorn in Jerusalem in his fifth book of the Pantagruel. All right. Let's move on briefly then to the second and final part of my paper. So I'll just make some concluding quick remarks here. So what's the lady and what does she have to do with the unicorn, this strange and mercurial mutating creature? Since Anne has rehearsed the five senses for you very wonderfully, I will just concentrate on the sixth. Can we come back to it? Okay. Is the lady taking the jewels or returning them? Is she receiving love and desire or returning it, renouncing it? This ambivalent double gesture, 
is at the heart, I think, of the drama of the tapestries. And I think it's one of the reasons. It's this deep ambiguity and wonderful tension of imagination that has provoked so many interpretations. Novels, three or four novels, including Anne's uncle. Um, so it's in the blood. Uh, <laughs> Georges Sand, um, Mary May, not to mention Rilke himself, who went back with recurring fascination to this uh, tapestry. Now, this double attitude to the senses and to the unicorn as emblem of the senses is very interestingly evinced in two very different forms of iconography of the senses. Both, it seems, or at least this is what Karl Nordenfeld uh, argues in that um, article which we distributed to you on the five senses, he says that there are two very different icons of the five senses, produced by the same master, more or less at the same time, that is to say, uh, Jean Dieck, master of Anne of Bretagne. And one of these is what we have behind us, the tapestry of the, of the five um, senses, but another very different one is a demonic representation of the senses in a ship of female follies. Maybe we could just look at that briefly. And here you have, if we can focus, uh, the different, if you can focus a little bit more, maybe not. Uh, so you have um, hearing, smell, sight. Oh yes, Adam and Eve, Eve in temptation. So that the lady here is uh, a temptress and a seducer and the origin of the fall and of evil. So by implication, if you transpose that to the tapestries, then the lady would be either Eve or the Madonna who redeems Eve. So the paradisal garden would replace the garden of Eve. All right. In other words, if the ship of women's follies, also known as the ship of temptations, the ship of fools, seems to condemn the senses, is it possible that the Cluny tapestries celebrate the senses, or at least reconcile us to them in a creative and spiritual fashion which goes beyond the traditional moral allegories of repudiation and renunciation? Is it possible indeed to see a certain progressive mutation and development, and mention this term development, which Alan, uh, Ellen Winner, of course, uh, made a central part of the presentation last week, but the developmental openness to the other, to the stranger. She took it in terms mainly of child psychology. So a progressive mutation of the unicorn to the five senses, leading to the sixth. Can we read this as an antidote to the demonizing of the senses, as strange and estranging, as animalistic and monstrous and fearful, and therefore countering a certain tradition of suspicion towards the unicorn and the senses. So instead of being merely seen as follies to be shed and renounced, might we not see this final double gesture of, of Le Dame returning or taking the jewels as not just an overcoming of the folly of the senses in favor of some spiritual sixth sense, but also an assumption of the five senses into a sixth sense that reconciles it. So therefore, a drama of embodied imagination where the animal and subhuman world on the one hand is reconciled imaginatively and artistically with the spiritual and divine. Not instead of, but along with. So you have a both and rather than an either or. The unicorn, therefore, on the one hand, hails its origin as an awful rhinoceros. And also embraces the awe-inspiring portrait of the unicorn as a messianic stranger who, can, who comes to bring love to the lady and to bring it more abundantly, either Gabriel or Christ in that reading. So let's finally return to the insignia, the inscription at the top of the, of the tent. Now, is the lady coming out of the tent or is she being drawn into the tent? Is the sixth sense a sensus internus, which 
Aristotle makes much of, which Michel Sayer, quoted by Anne, makes much of. An internal sense, where we need to withdraw from the outer senses in order to have a certain intellectual and spiritual and contemplative detachment. Or is she, as she receives and replaces the jewels in a double gesture, not also exiting from the tent and, in a sense, returning to the tent? And is this little gentleman down here, the monkey, not quite happy in this final scene, having been enchained, as Anne pointed out, in a previous scene? But not always in chain, because in smell, he's actually smelling a rose, a white rose, which is, of course, a mystical symbol for um, the Madonna, and in courtly love for the lover. So the monkey returns, and the rabbits return, and in fact, the rabbits are the most frequently represented in all of the six tapestries. They're kind of all over the place. <laughs> and you have your monkey here smelling the rose and enchained at the top and tasting down here for taste and then at large in the sixth sense. Um, now, rabbits are very interesting because as some of the commentators have pointed out, the rabbit is a traditional symbol for the female sex. The very word Conil in Old French comes from Coniculus, the Latin. In Irish Gaelic, it's actually Conil. And in contemporary slang, French, Con. So rabbits were symbols of fertility and procreation and sexual activity. Not only rabbits, indeed, but foxes and wolves and dogs and several other exotic creatures represented uh, in the tapestries are symbols of fecundity and fertility. So are these necessarily being enchained or is the symbol of enchainment here not similar to the capture of the unicorn? That is to say a step on the way, a containment, a taming, a certain renunciation of the monkey animal appetites in order to withdraw into the tent and then come back again, in order to replace the jewels and then take them back again, so that the replacing of the jewels could be read as a kenotic, loving self-emptying of the divine lady into the box of the senses, a, a moment of incarnation, the word becoming flesh, and then a resumption of the senses in this second uh, retrieval of embodiment. Now, if this be so, then we have in the tapestry a double reading. On the one hand, it represents secular love of the senses, courtly amour, courtly love. On the other, a spiritual love of free will and liberum arbitrary. It can be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be human and divine. It can be erotic and Celestial. And if Amon Sol Désir, the inscription, is an inscription for, that points us to beauty, this desire for beauty may be identified and has been identified with the heart. And here we come back, in a sense, to Jefferson also. He got some cœur, got son âme, as he puts it. If you look after the heart, you look after the soul. But the heart is not just the soul. The heart is the middle space between the soul and the senses. And it has always been traditionally interpreted as moving inwards and outwards. A, a symbol of embodiment, but also of transcendence at one and the same time. And if this is so, then we are witnessing here a overcoming of the traditional and ruinous dichotomy between the senses and the spirit. So in this sense, the sixth sense would be the sense of the heart. Okay, so my final question is this. Does the only desire of the inscription of the sixth tapestry represent a sixth sense which turns us inwards only, or both outwards and inwards, in a dual fidelity to the senses and the spirit? Does Ladame repudiate the jewels of the senses or reappropriate them to her bosom? 
as she does the unicorn itself in sight, where she receives it. If the former, the unicorn is opening into and giving both and giving birth to the senses, the heart emptying itself lovingly in an act of incarnation in and through the five senses. If the latter, then it would seem that as the sixth sense of the heart culminates the itinerary of the five corporeal senses, it becomes a final climax of spiritual and ascetic renunciation. The former is a movement of incarnation, the latter of disincarnation. The former, an embrace of the senses, the latter, a renunciation. And basically what I'm arguing is that the greatness of this tapestry is to combine both. The Lady in the Unicorn tapestry is above all unique in its representation of a poetical world subtly mingling the real and the imaginary, in its balance of composition, pose, and gesture, in its reconciling not only animals that are natural enemies, but also the contradictory tendencies of human nature, the physical world of the senses and that of the spirit. Its resolutely positive vision, faith in man and in a possible reconciliation, makes this hanging, which everything seems to date closely to 1500, perhaps one of the most revealing works of European art. A work that sees and witnesses the shift between two worlds, or simply two moments in history. One that was a slow maturing process rather than a sudden transformation. Those we know today as the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So this would be, the unicorn is hybrid not just as animal and divine, not just as sensory and spiritual, but also as representing medieval iconography and the forthcoming Renaissance iconography, where the different shifting visages of La Dame uh, would be comparable, for example, to the Primavera of Botticelli, a paradisal scene of reconciliation and love, a celebration of the garden of fertility and fecundity and joy and jouissance. The Song of Songs revisited. The lady as the Sholomite woman going to her lover, Solomon, and receiving her lover. And here, but we don't have time, we could go back to the, the sense of touch and ask, is the lady tightening or loosening her grip on the horn of the unicorn? Is she letting it go in an act of releasement, renouncing the senses? Or is she assuming it and embracing it to herself? Or both? Eros ascending and descending. Amon sol désir, the desire from a lover to a beloved. From A, Amon sol désir, to J, or H, or R, or P. Nobody can read the desiderat, the desiderat, the desiderat. And that openness of Signification leaves a circle from A to Alpha to Omega, from the first letter to the last, and desire, desire is in between. Just as this sixth tapestry has been seen by some as the opening of the cycle of the senses, by, other, uh, by others as the culmination and sublimation of the senses. If this is so, then this tapestry, this drama, this double gesture is about the heart as a swing door between embodied and spiritual imagination, between the imminence of carnal love and the transcendence of spiritual charity. Let me end with a brief quote from another poet, since we started with Rilke. Let's end with saint Exupéry who quotes the fox in Le Petit Prince, the little prince, you may remember. The fox who is apprivoisé, maybe like the fox in the, one of the tapestries, fox and the wolf, representing again sensuality, uh, courtly love. And now it's tamed. The fox is actually looking at a rabbit. It's not eating it, it's actually the lion lying down with the lamb. The fox lies down with the rabbit. And 
is a symbol itself of the heart. A privoisé, fox that has been reconciled with the human, the prince. Goodbye, said the fox. And now here is my secret, a very simple secret. It is only within the heart that one can see rightly. Thank you.